Maverick News, the antivirus program for your mind. And now, the Freedom Reporters. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Maverick News Channel. I'm Rick Walker. Big news tonight. Some are saying mark this date on your calendar as the official beginning of World War III. I don't know if it will rise to that level, but it certainly may. We have a situation where Iran has launched drone and missile attacks directly against Israel, apparently in retaliation or revenge for the attack against its consulate in Syria about a week ago, where we saw at least a couple of generals and some other high-ranking military officials killed. It was an unprecedented attack then, and it is an unprecedented retaliation now. Israel never actually formally claiming responsibility for that attack on the consulate. You can draw your own conclusions from that. But what's going on right now, very dangerous. A serious, serious escalation, tensions at an unprecedented level in the Middle East as a result. We'll get into some details on this. Also, um, at least seven people now dead in a Sydney stabbing spree at a shopping mall. We'll have some details on that for you. Uh, those are the those are the main stories. Also, I'm still in Costa Rica, and today I was checking out wildfires near here uh, of, of real interest, I think, to especially people in California and especially in Canada, where wildfires have been a real problem, especially over the last couple of years. And I'll, I'll tell you about the situation here in Costa Rica. They're also having problems with wildfires. We have all that. And I think Lori might be joining us on the program at some, at some point as well to help us make sense of what's going on with this situation between Iran, Israel, and as a result, the rest of the entire world. So stay with me. I'll be right back. Maverick News. Fighting for freedom. Greetings brave Mavericks. Our quest for truth continues. We go beyond fake news. Together we expose propaganda. Together we pull others out of rabbit holes. We are maverick thinkers. We are all unique individuals, individuals, defenders of individual rights and freedoms, credible, trusted, grounded in reality. Maverick News, Maverick, maverick News. Defending free speech, free speech. Donate at freedomreporters.com. Do it now. now. Tomorrow. Maybe too late. Too late. Too late. Too late. Maverick News. The, the world, world is, is watching. watching. Okay, it's loud here. It's very windy. There's music that just started playing in the background. I will speak loudly and uh, you let me know if you're having any problems and I'll do my best to cope with uh, these less than ideal studio uh, conditions uh, here this evening. Hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Um, 
So what's the situation right now in the Middle East? Well, Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps says it has launched dozens of drones and missiles directly at Israel. This is an attack that uh, is likely to trigger a major escalation between the regional uh, players in this. It's going to result, I think, very clearly into spillover in this Gaza conflict. Israel's military says that more than 100 drones, which Iraqi security sources were seen flying over the country from Iran, would take hours to reach their targets. Israeli Channel 12 says that some of them have been shot down over Syria or Jordan, but many of them are still airborne. Iran's state news agency um, is saying that a source um, is citing a source rather saying that its military has also launched a wave of ballistic missiles also directly targeting Israel. Now as I say this is Iran retaliating as they said they would for what it believes is an Israeli strike on its Damascus consulate. That happened April 1st. It killed seven guards, including two senior commanders. As a result, we've seen major escalation. Tensions escalate in an unprecedented way. And this all, of course, stemming from the Gaza war between Israel and Hamas. Hamas, of course, backed by Israel and, uh, or sorry, sorry, by Iran. And um, it's been going on now for about seven months with uh, accusations of genocide being leveled at Israel. Israel saying that it is uh, really a defensive posture. A response to the October 7th terror attack in Israel itself and Benjamin Netanyahu under intense political pressure. As a result, it isn't clear if he will even be able to survive this politically because of the hostage situation with many people domestically within Israel blaming Netanyahu for not effectively uh, being able to get those hostages back and for what many people see as an intelligence failure which resulted in the attacks and in that way holding Benjamin Netanyahu responsible for what Hamas actually perpetrated on October 7th. It's a complicated situation. So this is a very serious, a very dangerous escalation and many people speculating that it will result in the United States becoming more directly involved in this conflict. And we just heard even yesterday, President Biden saying that uh, his support for Israel, the United States support for Israel is ironclad. On the opposite side of that, you're obviously seeing Russia in alliance with Iran and relying on Iran to supply some of the weapons that are being used in Ukraine, especially those drones, those Iranian drones that Russia has been making use of. So there's a, there's a situation where Russia has really been forced into the arms of of Iran, just as Russia has been, I guess, allowed or maybe even encouraged to rush into the arms of China by United States foreign policy. The European Union, Britain, France, Mexico, Denmark, the Netherlands, others, all condemning Iran's attack tonight against Israel. Here's what it looks like. At least this is video we're receiving being told that this is what the skies over Israel look like tonight. I'm not sure exactly how accurate this is or if this is fresh or new, but it's being presented as new. Take it all with a grain of salt. We are at war, and this is an information war as much as anything else. Whoa, 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 whoa. Remember that, Dumin, Mish, remember that, Dumin. So we've been seeing video like that 
over the last uh, number of uh, number of days Israel's Iron Dome working overtime as Hezbollah also has been launching rockets at Israel and the Iron Dome doing its job taking those drones down and really taking a lot of wind here right now winds coming up here again hopefully you can still hear me it's a little bit difficult to um to operate here when the wind is up like this now the idf the israeli defense force is keeping people in israel informed with regular updates this is idf spokesman rear admiral daniel hagari on the current attack from iran let me just get him queued up i've got statement from the IDF to share with you here tonight. Okay, here we go. Statement from the IDF. Iran has launched a direct attack Iran. from Iranian soil towards the state of Israel. We are closely monitoring Iranian killer drones that are en route to Israel sent by Iran. This is a severe and dangerous escalation. Our defensive and offensive capabilities are at the highest level of readiness ahead of this large scale attack from Iran. Together with our partners, the Israel Defense Forces is operating at full force to defend the state of Israel and the people of Israel. This is a mission that we are determined and ready to fulfill. I will keep on updating you. Thank you. We'll continue to follow the IDF uh, updates and share them with you as, uh, as needed through this broadcast. Um, in addition to that, it's interesting to note that uh, the former Israeli Prime Minister Neftali Bennett uh, was just in Canada at the Canada Strong and Free Networking Conference, where he was um, asked to share his review, um, his and, and his comments on what happened on October 7th. I thought I would cue some of that up. He provides some insight into how he views the, the alliances and the axis that has developed as a result of the current political and war pod situation and war posturing that we're seeing in the Middle East here. Here's the former PM at the Canada Strong and Free Network Conference talking about just that. That's occurred for hours and hours helplessly, and that's exactly what happened. We're, we're very used to terror in Israel, a terror attack usually is winded up within 20 seconds to five minutes by people that are around the event. Um, and and uh, that's the cost of living in Israel. It's not that bad. I mean, it's a, uh, but shame on us. Um, there was a, a total meltdown of institutional Israel. Nothing was working well. And, uh, from my point of view, at 6.30 in the morning, sirens. I live in a suburb of uh, Tel Aviv, a, a very nice uh, uh, community. Uh, very rare to have uh, sirens there. We went down, my wife uh, and four kids and the dog, Lichi, uh, down to the shelter. And when we came, it was a Sabbath morning, a Saturday morning. I'm, I'm an observant uh, Jew. When I came back uh, to, uh, to my room, I turned on my uh, cell phone. And I began, I began getting on my cell phone at about 7.15. I began getting messages from a kibbutz called Kfar Aza. Uh, just as a way of uh, background, how, how did they have my cell phone? How did they know my number? Uh, when I was a minister in the previous years, every time there was a round of conflict and rockets were shot at uh, Israeli communities in, in the south, I had a habit. I'd go and sleep over at someone's house. Um, almost randomly, I'd bring one thing, a toothbrush, because uh, I wanted to be with them under fire and feel what it is. And I always love handing out my cell phone to people. Uh, you know why, by the way? 
because that way you get real information and quick. If you wait for the hierarchies of the bureaucracy of government, you get wrong information late. Um, so so that, that's what I always do. I bypass all the... Anyway, so I get these messages, 7.20 in the morning, Bennett, help, there's terrorists outside. I'm from Faraza, and I'm like shocked. And, and then another one, and I assume there's a, a massive attack on the kibbutz. I wasn't aware that it's a broad... So I called up the leadership of Israel, the military leadership, and said, get the heck down, get soldiers down there. Um, and I assumed within minutes it would uh, be solved. But it, 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 then they placed me in the, a WhatsApp group of the kibbutz members. So I, I saw everything that's going on. Ultimately, I, I got in my car, uh, drove to uh, um, my former military uh, reserve unit and um, tried to speed up uh, people going down. What happened is that at the beginning 6.29 in the morning, roughly um, 3,000 terrorists uh, armed with uh, machine guns, with anti... Thank you. Uh, armed with uh, uh, rockets, missiles, hand grenades, uh, breached the fence at about 50 different places uh, and attacked roughly 55, 60 different communities at the same time. Um, and and butchered uh, for hours and hours um, Israelis. What they did um, during those first hours, usually they came in, they took the cell phone of one of the victims, told them open up a Facebook Live session, and they filmed the whole thing live on Facebook, and... Israelis all across Israel began seeing what's going on. Um, there were several cases of um, parents uh, who saw their kids being murdered and then the parents murdered all alive. Uh, many cases of whole families being burnt alive. Um, there were cases, uh, over a dozen cases of uh, uh, rape and many more cases of, um, of uh, other atrocities. There were uh, babies that were murdered. So that's the one half of the story. The other half of the story, which is really important for me that you know, is not of the failure of Israel, of institutional Israel, but of the incredible uh, courage of the people of Israel, of Am Israel, the people of Israel. What happened beginning at about seven in the morning when the first people across Israel realized what's going on, thousands of Israelis got in their cars, drove down without anyone telling them to do it, without having any family members down there, and began fighting to fend off on their own initiative, fighting those uh, terrorists to, to beat them off. And they came from all the way from the north, from Tel Aviv, from Jerusalem, uh, from Haifa, from Be'er Sheva. Uh, I uh, spent the past few months talking and briefing most of them to learn lessons. So I, everything I tell you is not through media, it's from personal experience. Let me give you one example, but it's, it's very um, uh, you know, reflective of, of everyone. A guy called El Hanan, 42-year-old guy that lives near Jerusalem, a bit chubby. Uh, so he heard what's going on. He happened to hold a pistol. He called up his brother and their nephew. Uh, the nephew had a rifle because he was on leave from the army. Got in a car, drove down to one of the kibbutzim called Beri. For 16 hours straight, the th these three men uh, knocked on a, on a door of a family, evacuated them from their home in the kibbutz to the entrance of the kibbutz, which was already secure under fire, went back to the next house, back and forth, 16 hours. These three young men saved a hundred lives. So El Hanan at 9 a.m. on Sunday morning, the following morning, uh, he, he took a bullet and died. He left five children behind. I uh, visited his family at the Shiva visit. Later on, his cousin, 
uh, fighting in Gaza also fell and, and died. Um, but this is what what everyone everyone was doing this. So there's dozens and dozens of, of these remarkable stories of people that no one told them to do it. You know, I, I, I was living in uh, Manhattan on September 11th, uh, like the forest gump of uh, disasters. So I, I, I remember uh, rivers of, of uh, New York citizens walking quickly northward away from harm's way. And I remember the firefighters going south and we all hurried them. That's only natural. People always run away from harm's way, civilians. But here, they save the day. And I, I, by the way, I keep on saying young women, men and women, there's a reason. Um, in many, many locations, young women save the day. And, and uh, um, I have to admit, prior to October 7th, I, I felt that uh, the military is moving too fast on putting uh, women in, in, in all the combat units. I thought it was you know, too quickly. I was wrong. The women kicked ass. Let me tell you one story, if I may. W one story, just a, a 21-year-old girl that she visited uh, my house uh, about a month ago. She told me the story. She was a tank commander, uh, 40 kilometers away from the area, uh, and commanded a, a tank crew. Not She wasn't an officer, an NCO. So uh, she heard what's going on, got on the tank. They dashed towards the fence. Uh, breaking all the rules and identified one of the breaches a, a central breach in 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 the fence uh and saw about 150 terrorists trying to uh to enter israel and and they blocked it killing many many terrorists they saved six communities in the south they just held it for about 12 hours so and now i i was in awe here her story took about an hour to tell me because I, I like all the details. Where do you go then? When we finished, she said, uh, I, I, I feel a bit embarrassed, but can I ask a favor? And I said, anything you want. C could we do a short uh, TikTok video together? <laughs> now, now, no, but, but that's the point. You see, we had written off uh, the younger generation as a TikTok generation. And it turns out that it's the toughest generation we've ever had. Now, why am I telling you all of this? I'm telling you it because to wrap up the story, a total bureaucratic governmental failure, including the IDF, but citizens save the day, uh, give you a data point. There were actually four massacres altogether in the three kibbutzim and the party at Nova. There were another 50 plus battles in all of them usually six to ten Israeli citizens policemen and a bunch of soldiers but about six to ten managed to push off usually anywhere between 30 to 100 uh, armed terrorists by raw courage and ingenuity usually incurring one or two casualties so many of of these people lost their lives, but they prevented 50 other pogroms or massacres. And I'm telling you this for one reason, because the, the, there's sort of a, a cloud of depression. Israelis are now in trauma, uh, and, and understandably, I think, uh, and I accept that, but here's the bottom line. We have a, a, a nation with an amazing DNA. We knew that they're really smart and agile and startup nation and clever. That we all knew. What we didn't realize is how tough the younger generation is, how idealistic they are, how willing to sacrifice they are. And that combination is a killer combination, which gives me all the optimism that we're going to pull out of it and succeed. And what, what the Prime Minister did not say is after all the trauma was over and the confusion was over, there were 1,400, give or take, 
dead people, um, some of them dismembered in such horrible ways that it took dental records and all kinds of other things before they were able to figure out uh, who they were. The other thing that, especially if you look in the press these days, people forget about the hostages. There were 240 hostages um, taken. A hundred have been returned. Um, I've also heard some horrible stories about the treatment of the hostages. Um, also surprised that no one from the UN, the Red Cross, usually in situations like this, they go in and they get to visit them. So what can you tell us about the hostages, the ones that came back, the stories, and hypothesize on what the ones that are left are going through? So I, I spoke to many hostages that returned. Um, th there's um, significant uh, sexual abuse uh, of the hostages. And uh, unfortunately, about quarter to a third of the hostages uh, in their custody have been executed. Just point blank. Uh, the Red Cross is not given any access. Um, and obviously, all the pressure is on Israel all day because we're the bad guys. Um, time is running out. We have to operate quickly. Um, yeah, the hostages are. And, and just the other day, Israel asked Hamas to provide the names of the 40 hostages they might want to trade, and they couldn't come up with 40 names. Right. Um, we know, I, I, I don't want to elaborate on the intelligence uh, sources, but we know uh, it, it's uh, hell. We're going through hell as we speak at this very moment in, in all kinds of uh, rooms in, uh, across Gaza. The worst uh, imaginable atrocities. Before we get on to sort of geopolitical and the global issues, um, there's still about 150,000 Israelis today who cannot go home. They are, uh, they either were living in the Gaza envelope or they were living uh, in the north up near Lebanon. Um, rockets are still coming. Um, they're, they're traumatized. Um, what does normal look like? Is there a normal? Are they going to be able to go home at some point? So indeed, right now, tens of thousands of Israelis, both from the uh, south of Israel and from the north of Israel, are uh, displaced. They're, they're uh, living in uh, temporary uh, locations, usually hotels, uh, getting you know, education and all the service there. But it's uh, incredibly uh, unpleasant. It's, it's also not good for the family um, structure uh, and for work and for everything. What we need to do and what I would do, uh, I would first, I, I would try and not um, fight two fronts in, in parallel. I would focus on uh, wrapping up uh, Gaza and we'll talk about what that means. Then take care of the north, either with force or hopefully without, uh, by, uh, by uh, having a credible military uh, threat uh, to push Hezbollah uh, away from uh, the, the border. Just to, as a way of understanding, we're in a war with Iran. It's Iran who's fighting us. Iran doesn't have a joint border with Israel. Iran is a thousand kilometers east of Israel, but it's uh, an octopus of terror that sends its arms through proxies to fight Israel on our borders. So Hamas and Islamic Jihad in Gaza are Iranian proxies. Hezbollah in the north is an Iranian proxy. The Houthis in, uh, in Yemen, for heaven's sakes, the Yemenites, what are they, what business do they have with us? We're writing it down, we're not going to forget. There will be a time to close the, the, um, the open uh, uh, sheet here. Um, so, what, what uh, I did as a prime minister, uh, I had a doctrine which I called the the octopus, the Iranian octopus doctrine, uh, which said that we should try and avoid 
skirmishes on our border and rather redirect our energy to weakening Iran so ultimately this uh, regime will collapse and it will and and, and it, can I elaborate uh, I, I want to explain why this is not wishful thinking but it's an inevitable thing though it could happen in three months three years or 30 years so it depends a lot on our actions Iran not only is it a, is it a radical ideology, but as a, a government, it's a, it's a bit similar to the Soviet Union of the 1986, 87. It's a corrupt, very corrupt, very incompetent government despised by almost all the Iranian people. Uh, very soft. Uh, 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 empire of lies, of internal lies, and hence it will collapse. The, the people hate it. There's, uh, um, but a lot to accelerate that collapse. Uh, we could, uh, and I'm not talking about uh, I'm talking short of a military attack, huge economic sanctions, uh, cyber, overt, covert, empower the opposition there, much like uh, the CIA did to help. Valenza and others in, in, in the countries uh, of, of the Soviet bloc, and ultimately it will collapse. We need to do this quickly enough before they reach a bomb. So it's sort of a, a nuclear bomb, a race between the nuclear bomb and the collapse of the regime. I'm a bit frustrated with the West, who uh, seems to be kissing up to Iran all the time, uh, which is really stupid. There, There's a... There, there's an axis of uh, North Korea, China, Iran, and Russia, um, and, and clearly that's a, a, a very uh, sinister axis that we need to fight back, not by uh, um, trying to, to, you know, give gifts and, and uh, alleviate pressures, but quite the contrary, go all in, all in. And uh, I think all governments, uh, including the Canadian government, ought to adopt this. And, and it doesn't require war. Remember, America and the West never had to bomb the Soviet Union. But it did have to apply pressure and most of all, moral clarity. Uh, President Reagan was very clear who's good and who's bad. There aren't two sides here. There's a, a, an evil side, and that's that axis that I described. And there, there's the, the good side, and, and that's us. So w when you're very clear about it morally, then you can act, and we can win this. Hey. Oh, and that one there. Take a short break, come right back. We've got more as our coverage continues. On Iran's strike against Israel using drones. I'll be right back. What you're looking at here is video that is reported to be drones striking targets inside Israel, penetrating the Iron Dome. This is unconfirmed, but it is being reported as such. I would uh, caution everyone again, the 
before taking this as absolute fact, remember that we are at war. It is an information war. And while this appears to be authentic, it is still early and I have not had time to confirm this. It is being shared on many sites tonight. So I share it with you here as well. This is again footage which is said to be drone strikes inside Israel, drones from Iran penetrating the Iron Bowl. This obviously creates a whole new political situation in the Middle East because Iran has never attacked Israel in this way before. We know that the United States has been moving more military assets into the region. We know as well that uh, people are being advised not to travel to Israel or the Palestinian territory. Travel advisories being issued by Canada and the United States and many other countries as well. Also, all of this happening as Israel um, or an Israeli affiliated ship has just been seized by Iran in the Strait of Hormuz. This was a ship owned by MSC, commissioned, I believe, by Israel. Further complicating things. These kinds of ship confiscations, not unusual between these adversaries. Even the United States has seized ships, has been accused of piracy in that, in that way. Um, well, of course, the countries seizing the ships always say that they have some justification for doing it, and such is the case tonight. Now, none of the people operating that ship, the, uh, the Ares, as it is called, um, are actually Israeli. They are from a variety of different countries, including Pakistan. Um, I can't remember all of the different countries, but it's a, it's a multinational crew, and none of them are actually Israelis. It's uh, actually a Portuguese flagged ship. It had been commissioned by a company in Israel. So MSC leases the Aries from Gortel Shipping, an, an affiliate of Zodiac Maritime. And it's um, Zodiac is partly owned by Israeli businessman Ayel Ofer. So all of these. Uh, these things get to be rather complicated. And Israeli Foreign Minister Israel Katz has accused Iran of piracy, of course. Further complicating things tonight. World War III. We just heard the former Prime Minister of Israel say that he wouldn't want to fight on multiple fronts. Of course, Hezbollah has been launching rocket attacks, trying to penetrate the Iron Dome for, well, since the beginning of this conflict. And whether Israel likes it or not, they certainly have a war on multiple fronts now, tonight. That's the new reality of this situation. And uh, make no mistake, this will escalate now. It just did. Let's see what else we have on tap here for you. What else can I share with you this evening? Well, all that's been going on. Of course, we have protests in Toronto. I believe there was uh, dancing in the streets with these pro-Palestinian protests that we see almost, well, virtually every day. And they wrap up, of course, every weekend now. So there was a lot of, uh, lot of activity in that way today. 
as soon as news broke that Iran had launched these uh, these drones and missiles targeting Israel directly, people in the streets protesting were, of course, overjoyed to hear that. Let me see if I can find you a little bit of footage of the protests there today. Computer is a little bit sluggish here because, of course, we are on location out here in Costa Rica. And very, very windy here. So, again, sorry about any wind noise. There we go. So, I know that uh, the protesters were climbing up on heavy equipment. And, of course, igniting those smoke grenades, which pump out Israeli colors. And here's, uh, here's a little footage from Karim Assad, who, of course, does great work covering these protests, especially in the Toronto area and even beyond often. And this is what it looked like when news of Iran's attack it comes as a direct response to the bombing of Israel to Syria, Iraq, Palestine, Lebanon. Israel has bombed multiple countries. And I would like to make a quick the Islamic Republic of Iran has just sent tens of drones towards Israel. This comes as a direct response to the bombing of Israel to Syria, Iraq. Palestine, Lebanon, Israel has bombed multiple countries. Just a small sample of what was going on there. And I suppose what we can do here now is maybe move on to some of the other stories of the day because we do have some other important things to report here this evening. There was a stabbing rampage at a Sydney mall in Australia, left at least seven people dead, including the attacker. A variety of reports coming out of here and a little bit difficult to, again, at this point, assess absolute truth on some of this stuff because some asserting that this is a terrorist attack well uh, and and possibly perpetrated by a muslim other reports coming out as saying just the opposite that it isn't terror and yet another report coming out trying to suggest that the person responsible is actually jewish as you can see here's the headline stabbing rampage at sydney mall leaves at least seven people dead The attacker ran through the mall. I do have a picture of the perpetrator. One of the victims was a baby stabbed with a knife, approximately a hunting knife, approximately 30 centimeters in length. Here's a picture from a security camera of the person allegedly responsible that's what the guy looks like some reports identifying this person as a 
Benjamin Cohen. Again, I have not confirmed that. It's just the information that is circulating online tonight. And that has sent shockwaves, not just through Australia, but really around the world. And why this particular attack is getting the attention that it is, I'm not exactly sure. Because we have had, you know, in the United States, for instance, many, many, you know, we, we see multiple mass shootings sometimes in a month involving sometimes even more victims than this. This particular attack, though, getting a lot of attention. So that's piqued my interest, not so much just because of the horrific nature, but the level of attention it is receiving through media around the world tonight. That's another one we're just going to have to continue to follow because I'm just not really sure what to make of it yet. And with all of these stories these days, it's, it's my view that um, it's better to err on the side of caution and be right, correct, accurate than to be first and be wrong. Here's a picture of the baby that was uh, stabbed. I, what would possess a human being to stab a baby <clears throat> beyond me? Here's, uh, here's the caption on this. First time mom Ash Good threw her injured baby into the arms of strangers begging them to help despite her own horrific injuries, which later claimed her life after both being stabbed at Westfield Bondi Junction in Sydney, Australia. And there's the, uh, there's the child with the mother who is now deceased. Give it time and we'll find out but well, we'll get more information that should get us closer to the truth. Horrific. So we're still following that. And let me take a little break here. We will come back on the other side and uh, get some information on these wildfires, which... I'm sure you can relate to, especially if you live um, in wildfire prone areas like California or pretty much anywhere in Canada these days. Everybody's tuned right in to the situation with wildfires. I will be right back. The information war is raging. Truth without integrity is worth nothing. Maverick News. Because those who have power and those who seek it must be held accountable. The world is watching. Join our family of truth seekers. Donate today and add your voice to the chorus of Maverick Knights. Donate at maverickdonations.com. Truth. Integrity. It's the Maverick way. Maverick News. The world is watching. Okay. 
Okay, I'm back. And it, okay, so here I am in Costa Rica. And you know, today I went out and uh, I was checking out these wildfires, big forest fires that have um, been a problem, especially up in the in the hills, not far from where I'm at. This is uh, about a half an hour outside of Liberia, on the uh, on the coast. And of course, this will be of note to people back home because we've had such problems with wildfires. We're just coming into wildfire season in Canada. We had the worst wildfire season, forest fire season on record last year. The smoke was so bad that it reached New York City at times. I saw smoke from wildfires in Western Canada and Northern Ontario, all the way down in Southern Ontario. I've never seen that before. That was not just unusual, but also unprecedented. But you know, they have similar kind of problems here. Here are some, well, here's a little bit of video that I shot from a distance, first of all, today of this wildfire up in the hills. Uh, this is probably about half an hour from where I'm staying. So, so what can I tell you about this? I can tell you that uh, in just a week, more than 700 hectares or 1,700 acres of dry tropical forest have been affected by these wildfires in this area of Guanacaste, flames have run through three major national parks of Costa Rica. Guanacaste, Santa Rosa, and uh, some other nearby areas. And they're checking this out. The officials here, they think that some of these fires may be acts of arson. I was speaking to local people who also indicated that um, these fires are often the result of farmers who burn to clear land. And today, for instance, was a day which was very windy. And under these conditions, these fires spread like crazy. Mm -hmm. And that is exactly what I saw happen up in the hills, not too far from here, way over there. It started, fires started there in the morning and spread all the way across by the end of the day. Here's, uh, I've got some still images to illustrate this for you. Pretty crazy. Here's an image. So you can see that these fires are burning, tucked down into like a gully there, and all the smoke rising up. And the pictures don't do this justice like it doesn't give you a completely accurate depiction of how severe these fires are because as the smoke is drifting up and it gets up against the the blue and white bright sky you don't see the smoke uh, to the intensity that it is really present here's back further from the top of a nearby building so i can get up over top to, to get you a clearer shot this is a little bit closer in, and you can see that again, tucked down in this gully. A lot of, uh, a lot of foliage, a lot of trees burning. This is in this area the sort of the end of the dry season, where the risk of these wildfires is at its height. And if you look around here, this is a common problem because. If you look up into the mountains and the hills, what you get is what you're seeing. I see it's all brown. It's all very dry. And you can see that there isn't a lot of old growth on any of these 
area, in any of these areas because they, I think they have these fires happen quite often. Now also here, it doesn't appear as though they have anywhere near the firefighting capacity that we do in Canada or in certainly the United States. No water bombers here that I've seen today. I know there are fire crews up in the hills fighting these, these fires, but they didn't seem to make any headway at all today trying to extinguish these flames. So firefighting crews are said to be exhausted and waiting for reinforcements according to local officials. And some of the areas affected by these fires are only accessible by foot. And the trek involves sometimes walking three, five, 10 kilometers through wildlife trails. A helicopter has been uh, deployed to support the firefighters in this area. So I've been observing that as well. And emergency crews, even from a, a real estate developer in this area have been uh, deployed. So you've got a lot of volunteers going in there to help after receiving proper instruction and some training. But as I say, they don't have the resources here to battle these blazes uh, like we do back in Canada. And so in many cases, it appears that these fires are really just left to burn and extinguish themselves over time as the, uh, the fuel is extinguished or exhausted, I should say. So a significant portion of the Horizon Botanical Research Station is being threatened by these wildfires. And at this station, native plant species are cultivated and protected for reforestation efforts. And the firefighters have therefore been working diligently on surrounding that area with new fire breaks. But these drought conditions in this region, they're forcing the crews to fight the wildfire mostly with hand tools and heavy equipment. In some cases, they don't even have water. So it's a totally different scenario here. And again, you know, this gives me some indication of what life is like here. Nobody here really seems concerned. You, you can see where I'm at right now. I can see smoke often, you know, on the horizon here, away from me. And nobody seems to be phased by it at all. I was thinking, you know, all it would take is for the wind to carry some of those embers over here and set some of these buildings on fire. But it doesn't seem to be, it doesn't seem to be too much risk of that at the moment. And people, a lot of them just even oblivious, just walking around, not even paying it much mind. But it is a serious problem. And it just shows that, I guess, as much as it's a problem back home in Canada and parts of the United States, where we have these wildfire seasons and a lot of damage done, we're not the only ones who uh, are battling these kinds of problems. You know, they struggle with it here as well. Let me take another break. I'm going to just check some things, see if I can get the most up-to-date information on this Iran attack on Israel tonight, and I'll come back and join you on the other side. Hello, world. Are you awake? Uniting humankind by liberating millions of minds at a time. Maverick News. The world is watching. Okay, so I know that uh, in Canada, Justin Trudeau has been briefed on the situation in the Middle East. Of course he has been. But uh, while all that is going on tonight, it's the, um, the press dinner. The annual uh, shindig where Prime Minister dines with the mainstream media, the mainstream legacy media. We'll, uh, we'll monitor that for you as well and probably have some comments on that for you tomorrow evening. 
And Iran also issuing a very serious, it sounds anyway, a stern message to the United States tonight saying that if the United States takes any action against Iran in response to this attack against Israel, it will be met with a swift response and instant remorse, is I believe the, um, the correct translation. So that's where things stand tonight, folks. Yeah, and I thought Lori was going to join us on the broadcast here tonight, but so far no sign. Um, so that's unfortunate. I'm sure she could have contributed greatly to the conversation tonight, but that's okay. That is okay. I think that's about it. Let me just uh, just double check a couple of things here. As we prepare to wrap things up. Yeah. Escalating tensions, man. And so I'm not sure, I, I've not been able to confirm that those drones actually did strike inside Israel. I would take that video with a grain of salt. That video that I showed you, let's, it's, it's okay to look at it, but, but keep in mind that it could be entirely fabricated. It could be old recycled video. It's hard to tell exactly what was hit in a video like that. And there's a lot of propaganda out there. So until we get some confirmation and some 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 solid evidence to show exactly what might have been hit or wasn't hit, then I'm going to reserve judgment on anything that we're even presenting to you here tonight in terms of video or images that we're, we're, we're curating off social media. Now, also, what can I show you about... Let me see what's going on in these with these freedom protests, shall we? Um, the axe, the tax, freedom protests ongoing at many locations across Canada. I think some of them, you know, bigger than others, and still not generating the numbers that the, you know, the people involved would like to see. That much I think is fairly clear. That being said. Um, I think some of these protests where farmers have been involved have been actually quite successful, depending on the locations. Out in uh, Alberta, we've seen a petting zoo set up. <laughs> uh, true story. Not making it up. Not making it up. Yes, they did. They set up a petting zoo. Farmer came out. Now, what am I seeing at that location? I'm seeing, hard to tell, maybe maybe 20, maybe 30 vehicles, including trailers, etc. Including a guy who showed up in a tractor that I think he drove, a 1970s Massey Ferguson tractor that he drove all the way there over an 18-hour period. To join the acts, the tax and protest, and there's the petting zoo. Again, you know, personally, just my personal thing, I would not take my kids there to the side of the Trans Canada Highway to a protest. I don't think it's a great place to take kids or pets. In this case, I don't think these ducks and geese and goats are probably going to care that much, but um, <laughs> just. Okay, it, let's set up a petting zoo. Well, I think you understand the strategy there, right? Yeah. Oh, there they are. The protesting critters out of the side of Highway 1 and uh, where Highway 20, the Highway 22 Junction meets at the Petro-Canada Rest Stop. 
And then, of course, this is on a service road connected to like a, a service area where truckers, motorists can pull over and and have a rest. And that's where this this particular protest is located, the Axe the Tax protest. And so it's ongoing. I believe this is day 12, I think. So, yeah. Yeah. Now, again, personally, and I'm just going to restate this because I, this is on the side of, get, get this through your heads, okay? This is on the side of the Trans-Canada Highway, and the vehicles are not slowing down. Now, they are in a side area where they're parked away from the highway. Nevertheless, if you take your dog and it gets off the leash, bad things can happen. That's all I'm saying. And you take your kids there. Why? Why? It's just my thing. If you want to go protest, go protest. You know, I'm not going to tell anybody what to do. I just personally, I would not take my kids to the side of the Trans-Canada Highway, petting zoo or no petting zoo for a protest. Um, but hey, we all have to do what we think is the responsible thing to do. That being said, press gallery, dinner, speeches tonight. We'll see what JT has to say about the carbon tax during his address, his speech to the to the media this evening and we'll pick it up tomorrow i was supposed to uh, join Lori for strange bedfellows tonight but i understand the program has been preempted which is okay because i'm way down here in costa rica i was not going to be able to join her i have the uh, family stuff that i have to uh, to take care of here important family stuff tonight and uh so unfortunately i was going to have to pass on joining them for that broadcast tonight but it's preempted anyway because of these new developments in the middle east so i'm sure that we'll get back to that uh, another evening and i will continue to monitor the situation in the middle east through the evening if something really significant happens um you know once i wrap up with this family stuff i'll be i'll be monitoring and if i need to i'll come back on and and alert you guys let you know what's going on but right now we are up to date and with that Hi, I'm going to wrap things up here on this April 13th, 2024, a date that uh, we should probably remember. Mark it down. It may be one of those days that, you know, you'll remember for years to come. Where were you when World War III officially broke out? Some people viewing the developments today with that level of gravity. Will it rise to that? I hope not. Pray. Hug the people you love. And let's hope for better things tomorrow. Love you guys. See you tomorrow night on the flip side. This has been a Maverick Multimedia Productions.